Thank you, everyone. I'm Tira McKelvey with Rent Mason Bees, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be speaking to you guys. I've worked really hard on this presentation. I have videos embedded. Wait till the very end, because I just produced a brand new video this week that took me two years to film. Some of you have already seen it, if you're following my YouTube channel. Um, but I um, have to, first of all, thank all of you as Master Gardeners, because I myself have come to your booths at Farmer's Market, have uh, utilized your services, because I know nothing about gardens. I know a lot about mason bees and leafcutter bees, but nothing about gardens. And so you've really helped me over the years when I've come up, I'm like, oh, what do I do with this? And um, a house that I recently purchased that my family lives in was previously owned by a master gardener. The yard is like amazing. So we'd be sitting out there and something would bloom. I'm like, what's that? And so I have an app that takes pictures and tells me what it is and how to take care of it. So you guys are experts in what you do and I really value and appreciate everything you're doing to go out and educate and teach more gardeners and more people about how to care for your gardens and all your yards. So thank you for everything you guys are doing. Um, I'm excited to share with you my love of mason bees and leafcutter bees. Um, a lot of people, it, Anybody have mason bees currently? Oh good, perfect. Does anybody know, do you all know what a mason bee is? Okay, good. All right, so let me get going on this because there's a lot and I guess I have an hour so I can talk slow. All right, so um, not a lot of people know that 90% of bees are solitary bees. So honey bees are your social bees. They have a hive, bumblebees have a hive, they have a colony, they, they have all that. Solitary bees means that every female lays all her own eggs, finds her own nest, and gathers her own food. So she does it all by herself, solitary, alone. That's what that means when you hear what a solitary bee. I didn't know what solitary is. Solitary bee. So that's what a solitary bee is. They're amazing pollinators because they have little hairs on their belly called scopa, so they belly flop onto those flowers and they collect pollen all over them. So they pollinate 95% of everything they land on. Um, they uh, pollinate up to 2,000 blossoms a day and they help our honeybee population. So when we're using solitary bees in orchards and farms, which more and more farmers are using, they're getting a greater return of yield on food because they're such amazing pollinators and they're helping our, our honeybees because the honeybees just get moved around and they get exhausted and worn out. So farmers are start, starting to utilize solitary bees with their hives, but they're not having to do as many hives. So they get both get along. I get asked that question a lot. Do honeybees and mason bees, they all get along. They don't compete with one another. So. Um, and they don't sting. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but they're sweet little bees. If you watch my videos, I have a little passion for these little mason bees. They're super sweet, amazing little pollinators. So. Um, all right, so I love this slide. Um, I speak a lot and I teach kids and programs in schools and I speak at master gardener groups and I love teaching about bees. And so I love this slide because it gives you a different uh, between the two. Everyone knows what a honeybee is, but not a lot of people know what a mason bee is. So here in the Pacific Northwest, in Washington State, in, um, we have the blue orchard mason bee. So the blue orchard mason bee is a native B. It's a species to our area. It is native, which is really, really important. We're going to get into a little bit more about that. But it's really important to know that what you're releasing in your yard are native. You're helping your native bee populations, which is really key. Um, honeybees, there's been a trend over the last three years with Save the Bees and the honeybee hives and getting the colonies. And that's great. We love all bees. Um, but there are a lot of maintenance and there are a lot of work if you have hives. Um, so, and they're brought over from Europe. So they're a honeybee queen will lay, I'll jump down, a honeybee queen will lay 2,000 eggs a day, whereas a mason bee female, 15 in her lifetime. Very different life cycle. Um, so again, I love belly floppers, and I talk to my kids in school, you know, they have like little hairs on their belly and they flop on those flowers. So what they collect is that loose pollen all over their bodies, whereas the honeybees meticulously collect it in their back hind legs, and they have to carry it back to the hive for the worker and the queen and all that. Well, because mason bees have this little hairy body full of pollen, it's loose. And so when they go into another flower, it flops on and they just drop pollen everywhere. They are mother nature's best pollinators. They are really, really important for our habitat and our ecosystem. And again, they pollinate 95% where the honeybees only pollinate 5% because they've got to very carefully carry it back. Um, our mason bees don't make honey. They don't have a hive. They don't have a queen to protect, whereas honeybees do. Um, this enables them, they're not aggressive. 
you can stand, you'll see in some of my videos, you can stand right up to the block and they don't even bother you. They're not, and same with honeybee hives, that's the same thing. But honeybee hives, if they feel um, threatened, they'll, they'll, they'll sting you. But mason bees are super sweet. There's no, they're not aggressive at all. They're the sweetest little bees. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so that's, I got already to the bottom. Um, so I get asked this a lot. Oh, I hate mason bees. They chew holes in my wood and they bore and they're like, nope, those are the carpenter bees. The mason bee mandibles are not strong enough to chew wood. Those are carpenter bees. But mason bees might use carpenter bee holes because mason bees have to rely on finding natural holes in your habitat. So my deck umbrella was filled up with a mud plug this spring because they found a hole and she used it to lay her babies in. So you'll find holes in, I've heard a guy earlier today, he laid holes in my tractor. I'm like, well, it was a good size hole. They're gonna go lay babies in there. So they find natural holes in your habitat to lay their babies. Um, mason bees emerge in early spring. When temperatures reach about 55 degrees is when the mason bees emerge. They hibernate like in a cocoon, like a butterfly, all winter long, and then they emerge. They cut out of that cocoon. So let's see, this is your, my first video to see if it works. You go okay sorry so I was saying that um, that one bee coming out of the cocoon was our cover bee on Mother Earth News Mother Earth News did an article about solitary bees and I went out to my mailbox to get the magazine and it was on the cover and I was like oh solitary bees are finally getting ex you know the exposure they need so it was so exciting but that was that that bee is famous um, and then that little guy holding the bee was my son holding he loves to help me with the bees so as do all the kids, by the way. Kids love mason bees. So this is a great picture to show you the distinction between a male and a female. So the males will emerge first. Um, the male is the smaller bee on the top, and they have a white tuft of hair on their head. So when you see the pictures in the videos that I'm going to be showing you throughout this presentation, when you see a little white tuft of hair, those are the male bees. They're usually most of my videos because they come out first, and the girls are so hard to get on camera. Um, but they emerge first and then the girls come out about one to two weeks later so the guys go off fly off they'll mark your tube or wherever they emerge from with a muddy scent mark it looks like mud it's this brown tannish color and then they fly off when the girls emerge they go fly off and look for the boys so a lot of times you're like well i saw everything emerge but now i don't see anything back well they're going out having lots of piggyback rides and having a lot of fun and then once <laughs> and once she's fertilized then she'll start laying her babies so it's a, pretty cool, it's a pretty cool process to see. But if you see your mason bees fly off, so also when she's out looking for the boys, she might find natural holes in your habitat. So you might be setting up a mason bee house in your yard. They might not be coming back, but they're out there. They're just finding natural holes in your habitat. So mason bees, mason, mason rework, mud, they use those mandibles to construct their nesting chambers. So she'll take that mud and she'll plug that uh, cover of your, out of the outside of your mud plug to protect her babies inside. And this is an inside of a nesting chamber. So every single nesting chamber will have a mud, pollen, baby, mud, mud, pollen, baby, mud. And she'll leave that little pollen loaf and that baby will eat the entire thing. These are some of the cool new stuff I have to show you guys. So I wanted to show this um, because I have a, a, a good hour and I get to really educate you guys. And so if you follow my YouTube channel, Rent Mason Bees, I have a ton of educational videos that you are welcome to use for education purposes or for yourself. This is one of them where I do a three-part series of what are your baby bees doing. And I open up the nesting block and I show you inside what your baby bees are doing from one week, a couple weeks later, so you can see the growth of how they go from tiny larva into a cocoon. It's pretty cool. You can see here, we have a plug, a plug, a plug, and then these three cells don't have plugs. So let's see what's going on inside. Oh, 
oh, look at that. So those cells that didn't look like there was anything in them, look what's deep inside. Baby larvae. Oh, and look at that, you guys. Oh gosh, I have to be super gentle and not shake the camera. Uh, hold on one second. Let me set this down very, very gently because there's babies in there. Okay, look at this. There are teeny tiny larvae eating the pollen loaf. Oh, I need to switch to my macro lens and get these little little bees up close. Oh, this is fascinating. So look at this cell, you guys. Look how many bees are in this cell. Now there's no cap at the front, so that means maybe, well, there's a cap there, but there's no cap right here, same here. And look how many cells are in here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Well, I said five to seven, but this bee was an overachiever. There's 13 cells in um, cells in there, so mud, pollen, baby. So um, I did this slide um, this season because I finally had enough pictures and video uh, to show you the life cycle of a mason bee. And so um, we're going to also show you videos of some of this stuff too, but it's pretty cool to see the different stages. So again, they start off in piggyback rides, she lays an egg, it hatches and becomes a larva, and then that's when they start eating the pollen, and they get bigger and chubbier, and then they start to spin a silk cocoon, and then they spit more cocoon, more silk and more silk until they're all the way into a cocoon, and then they emerge the following spring. So I know this is a little bit, but there's another part in here that you didn't see. I know, right? That's so much, I have goosebumps. It's so, it's so amazing to see the life cycle of these little bees. So sh that little bee is gonna spin that cocoon and make it really strong and hardy. And that cocoon becomes waterproof. It protects it all winter long. In the same space that it has yes. Been Correct, yes. So I have at my booth upstairs, um, I brought samples. So if you wanna come see, I have blocks open to show you inside, that's pretty cool. Um, but yes, in that same cell, mud, pollen baby mud, the pollen is gone. It devours the entire loaf of pollen and it builds up that energy to then spin the silk cocoon and then it metamorphosizes. So it's gonna, it's gonna turn into a full grown bee before winter hits. And then it's gonna hibernate in that cocoon all winter long as a full grown bee. And then it emerges. So the females only live about six to eight weeks. So the boys live about two weeks. Their job is to do one thing and then the girls will carry on to pollinate and lay their babies. And so um, they only live six to eight weeks, which is why it's really important. At the end of spring, you're removing your nesting material. So if there's lots of things I wanna really have you take away, you're not leaving your mason bee blocks out all year round. They only live six to eight weeks. You need to remove your mason bee block. If you wanna scan this QR code, you can watch the video later, or I have it all up on my YouTube channel to teach you how to store them. You wanna store them the holes upright in the block so that the babies are laying on top of the pollen. So if you have cardboard or cardboard tubes or you have a nesting block, if it's flat, you don't wanna lay it on, you wanna like kind of tilt it up and store it with the holes upright. If you're in our program, we teach you and handhold the whole way or just follow my newsletter. If you sign up for my newsletter, that's another way. Even if you do your own bees, I'll teach you throughout the whole process and share all the cool new videos that we do. Um, so we, because we are the largest solitary bee provider in the country, we work with a bunch of different research teams. Um, half my team right now is currently in Utah at the Orchard Bee Association meeting. Um, uh, it was, it's an incredible meeting where all the Orchard Bee, um, all the growers and the people that raise them in the science and the research, we get to sit and learn about what they're studying, about the predators, about the diseases, about how we can do better to help our pollinators so that we don't have decline. So the things that I'm sharing with you today aren't like, oh, this is what you need to do. This is science, this is research, this is data that says you have to clean every fall, you have to make sure you're taking care of your solitary bees. So we're gonna teach you how to create a healthy habitat for your bees. 
So um, that was us. We went to the B Lab. Um, oh, that was so cool. Um, I'm working on a video. When I did that last year, we're still waiting to get it approved. But it's a pretty neat video that hopefully we'll have up soon. Um, so these are pollen mites. Pollen mites harm all our predators. And I, I have at my booth upstairs, upstairs, um, pollen mites. And I, I have uh, my phone <clears throat> with my macro lens that you can come over and if you really want to see, I'll show you what pollen mites look like up close. They're creepy ca crawly. Um, but it's really important because what happens with pollen mites when you don't clean your nesting block is this is a pollen mite. These are pollen mites. So these are just, they completely take over. Remember the mud, pollen baby, mud, mud, pollen baby? Well, that cell had a few pollen mites in it that they just multiply rapidly. It kills the little baby inside, and it takes over that cell. So what happens is when the mason bees emerge out of a healthy cocoon, these are healthy cocoons, okay? When they emerge, they crawl through the pollen mites. The pollen mites stick to their back, and then they go and spread pollen mites all over your yard. They pick up bumblebees, honeybees, everywhere. So these are really easy to clean out of your nesting blocks, but you have to use the nesting material that you can open and clean every fall. This is why, there's numerous reasons, but this is one of the main reasons that you wanna harvest and clean. So I get calls all the time, okay, I've got, a mess, I've, got a, I've got bamboo, which you can't open and clean. I've got a log with holes drilled, which is the old way of doing it. We can't, we, this, we've got to start shifting the way we're raising mason bees. If you're putting out a bee hotel, we've got to have proper maintenance and care for them. Um, so, so when you're doing the, when you're ta seeing the pollen mites, you can easily clean them out. Okay, close your eyes if you don't want to see pollen mites up close. I got music to go with it. <laughs> Yeah, so it will kill this bee, but it'll also be spread all over your flowers in your garden. So I know it's a sad video to show, but it's really an impactful piece to make sure that everyone starts cleaning and taking care of their pollinators and that as educators yourself, you're teaching people how to do that because I know a lot of people have their own mason bees and we love that. We'll support how to clean and take care of them. But these are just really important slides and to teach everybody about pollinators and pollen mites. Chalk brood is another uh, disease that impacts our uh, solitary mason bees and other pollinators, uh, honeybees as well. So chalk brood is a fungus. It's a fungus, it's a spore that lives on the flowers that the bees are collecting their pollen from. And what happens is that mama mason bee, she'll collect that pollen and she'll carry it into her, her nesting chamber. She'll lay that pollen loaf and then her baby and then a mud cap, right? Mud, pollen, baby, mud. Well, that baby will eat the pollen loaf. It eats that whole pollen loaf. But there's a spore, there's a fungus and a spore in there that's, that's called chalk brood, and it ingests that. Well, what that does is it eats them from the inside out, it dries them up, and then the, they burst. And so then there's thousands of little spores that burst. Well, those sit in your nesting chamber, and then the pollen might sit in your nesting chamber. So this is why it's really important to clean, because you, you have to put out new nesting material every season, because this stuff lingers. You, don't, you can't just put out another block. It, they stay. You can see how microscopic they are. They're going to stay in there. Houdini fly. Anyone see the Seattle Times article about the Houdini fly and the rise of Houdini fly? They're, we're starting to see an increase in Houdini fly. Um, they're really prevalent as well. So these, I have videos on our website that you can reference the videos inside to see what's inside, but um, these are Houdini fly. So you can see a mud pollen baby. Well, what happens is the Houdini fly looks like a fruit fly. It literally is the size of a fruit fly. It's so tiny. So what, it ha what happens is that little kleptoparasite, Houdini fly, sits outside the block, waits for Mama Mason to leave, She'll go into the hole, she'll lay her babies next to the pollen loaf or the baby that's in there. Mama Mason doesn't know. Mama Mason will cap it with mud. Now it's mud, pollen, baby, Houdini fly, mud. Those Houdini fly will hatch, they'll eat the baby, they'll eat the pollen, and then it lingers in there. So when you see this in your nesting block, that's called frass. That is Houdini fly poop, 
frasses poop in the bee world. Um, and you can see how this was completely taken over by um, Houdini fly. So easy to spot, easy to clean, easy to get rid of, right? So these are really, so those three slides that I showed you, super easy taking, uh, cleaning all of those to make sure you're taking care of your mason bees. Mono wasps, those are your summer predators. So, mo so you're not leaving that nesting block out all year round. Uh, at the end of spring, beginning of summer, you're removing that nesting material and you're storing in a cool garage or set, again, with those holes upright. Mono wasps, if you leave your bees out, when I get blocks back to clean and there's grass sticking out of it, I know that block's been out over summertime because you'll have wasps that have grass-dwelling wasps that'll go in and they take grasshoppers and grass and they go in and that's how they feed their babies, but they utilize your nesting block to do it. They take out the mason bees and they go in there and do it. So this is an ovipositor. It's not a stinger. This mono wasp will crawl into your nesting chamber, or if you have paper tubes, easy for them to penetrate. You'll see a hole, you'll have your paper cardboard, and you'll see a hole on the outside. That's from them poking. So they'll find that cocoon. She'll poke her ovipositor into the cocoon, and then she'll lay her babies inside your baby bee cocoon, and then it will kill your baby bee. Okay, so here's another. That is what a mono wasp looks like. I love the music, I, it's Halloween time, so I'm like picking out scary music. But see the ovipositor? And again, it's tiny, like a fruit fly, super tiny. Yeah. Okay, so again, there's things you can do to make sure that doesn't happen. So, Here's the big things that you guys need to take away and help share and help teach and educate is you don't want to use bamboo or logs with holes drilled in it. You can't clean that nesting material. Bamboo also collects um, mildew and mold. You'll see when I take apart people's old kits, you can see the black in the back of it. It's just really bad for your bees. You're removing them at the end of spring. At the very beginning of summer, end of spring, you're removing your nesting material. Whatever you're using, you wanna take it and store it in a cool garage or shed. You're gonna to wanna to clean your cocoons over uh, fall. Our big harvest where we do the three million mason bees is next week. It's mind blowing, it's, it's really cool. Um, and then you wanna put out clean nesting material every spring. So whether you're cleaning it yourself, whether you're taking fire and flame and cleaning out your wood blocks, or you're putting brand new cardboard tubes out, you want clean nesting material. And then you want to create a very healthy pollinator friendly yard. So mason bees emerge early spring, they need that early spring bloom. So I know there's a lot of programs here that will teach you what to plant in your yard for early spring blooms. If you have old nesting material and you're ready to transition and start creating a healthy habitat. You can scan this QR code or you can uh, go to my YouTube channel, but there are ways that you can save the baby bees inside. Some people that leave their blocks out, they're full of mud plugs right now, right? You can either go in, I've done this before with a couple of blocks that have been brought back where um, it's kind of like this style or this style. Well, I'll rip open the frame of the house, literally grab a chisel and some pliers and I'll crack it open like crab, crack it open and then chisel open the bamboo in the fall, once, those, once they've spun the silk cocoons, and then I'll pull out any cocoons I can find to save them. Sometimes they're hard to get to, because some, some of this bamboo is really thick, right? It's hard to crack. But if you can, save the baby bees inside, do that. If you have a log with holes drilled in it, you never can clean that. That's just gonna become a predator habitat over time. All of these will become a predator habitat. So we have a method that you can do where you take your nesting material in spring when everything's gonna emerge, you lay it with the holes upright with fresh, clean nesting material around. Sprinkle sawdust on the top of it. The bees will emerge, the sawdust will fill back in the holes. They won't want to nest back in there and then you get rid of that nesting material. So that's a way to save your baby bees. Will they emerge with pollen mites? And if there's, yes, but you're gonna clean them in the next season and then they'll be okay, right? So if you have never cleaned it before, you'll be surprised with what you find inside. Then your spooky Halloween music will really come into play. All right, so this is how we do our bee baths. So if you're raising your own mason bees and you wanna clean them yourself, this is the time to do it in the fall. We do ours in October, fall harvest, October, November. Um, you're gonna to wanna to take them out of your nesting material, whatever you're using. 
you're going to want to use, so we use one cup of bleach to 20 gallons of water. It's a lot. For you on a smaller scale, you're going to use two teaspoons of bleach to one gallon of water. Very, very mild. But what we've learned with research teams as well is what kills the pollen mites and the chalk brood spores is the bleach. So you're going to want to have them soak in that bleach solution for about 15 minutes. Not any longer, just about 15 minutes, okay? We use a, a cat litter scoop to mix them around and stir it and then drain it, right? And then you're going to want to rinse them out. Our process is pretty mind-blowing to see. Um, we put them in a drying rack overnight, which, which looks like a, a screen on your window, right? You can sprinkle out your cocoons to have them dry overnight. And then we light them. We have this massive light table. This is when we love volunteers to come in and help next week for our harvest because we literally pick through three million cocoons. We literally pick through every single cocoon. What we're looking for is the amber that's see-through, that's not viable, something got to it, and we pick out all those cocoons. And then we uh, sterilize the nesting blocks. There are no bees in this block. I don't want to freak people out. That block has been emptied, and then we sterilize it again with the flame. So if you have your own wooden blocks, sterilize it with a lighter and just hold it over. Okay, so I wanted to share and then we store them in hibernation. I wanted to share our fall harvest video because not a lot of people have seen this. It's pretty fascinating. So, hey everyone, it's Tier Earth Red Mason Bees. I am back out at our Bothell location and we are harvesting over 3 million mason bee cocoons this season. Um, thank you for returning your blocks. A lot of these bees that we will be harvesting will be going back to our gardening program and then a lot of them will be sent to our farmers to help grow more crops of apples and cherries and blueberries and almonds. So I wanted to show you a little bit about how this whole process works. So we're here in our room where we have all of our blocks. Most of these are already sterilized and cleaned and ready to go for next season. Um, but we still have quite a few yet that we need to harvest. So I wanted to show you our Bob Harvester machine. This is Craig Watts. He's gonna demonstrate what we're doing with this harvester. We created and invented this machine to help us extract the cocoons out of the blocks. You'll see that they all still have the mud plug and we're gonna turn this thing on and show you how we process the bees and they go through and they get pushed out of the block. And uh, go ahead and start up the machine. So as you can see, each block is being pressed out and all the cocoons are coming down. All the debris from the blocks are being extracted out of the box. And you can see down here, everything is coming out of the blocks. That includes the pollen mites, the mud, the Houdini fly larvae, all of this is coming out. But as you can see, we also have a lot of really great cocoons. So let me show you the next step of how we then clean and clean these cocoons to get them all ready for next season. All right, after we get done extracting all of your cocoons from the nesting blocks, we, as we showed you earlier, have a whole bunch of mud and pollen mites and cocoons that we then pour into this sifting tray. And Jim, our owner, will sit here and sift the bees. And you can see, we try to get off as much dirt and debris as we possibly can. It gets to be quite a dusty process, but we do our best to get as much of the dirt off in the sifting process. And then over here in the fire station, it's really important for us to sterilize every single nesting block that comes in. And as you can see, we move it very slowly over the flames to go through every single cell of your nesting block. That eliminates all the pollen mites and the fungus and any other predators that may be in there. And we completely get rid of all of those, those mites. So it's a really fun, it's actually a really fun thing to watch. Um, and then after that, those sterilized nesting blocks go over to our strapping station where we strap them up and we get them ready for next year. So then you will be sent clean, sterilized nesting blocks for your gardens next year. Um, all ready to go. All right, now that our bees have been sifted and we got as much dirt as possible off of the bees, we give them a bath in our handy dandy bee bath. This is one cup of bleach to 20 gallons of water. And we dump our dirty cocoons into the bee bath and we take our handy dandy cat litter scoop and we mix them up and we wash them and we rinse them. For about 15 minutes, they soak in this bleach bath. 
and then we take them and we put them onto our conveyor belt to rinse the final cocoons with fresh clean water. We spread them out on our conveyor belt. I'll get a couple of scoops here so you can see it. And then these little cocoons will travel through this bath of water, fresh clean water, get off all the rest of the debris if there's anything remaining on them. They'll come down at the end and they will come out on our drying rack. We spread all of these bees out and as you can see there's just trays and trays down here that we keep rotating. This drying rack will sit overnight and then in the next day we will pick through every single cocoon to pick out the non-viable bee cocoons through our, on our light table. And that is part of our bee bath. After our bees get a bath, we put them on the drying rack and the drying rack dries all of the bees overnight under a large fan. And then we bring the drying rack out the next day and we hand pick through millions of bees, all the ones that are not viable. So we have our volunteer Janet helping us today and we have Michelle helping us pick through all of these cocoons to pick out all the non-viable bees. So if you see a cocoon that you can see through, so if you can see this one up close, these, these cocoons are not viable. Something got to these bees and they didn't survive and they didn't make it. So we literally pick out all the cocoons that are not healthy anymore to make sure that next year you're getting healthy, strong bees and that our farmers are getting healthy, strong bees. So then you can see this box over here. All of these cocoons are washed cleaned, no more predators, and healthy and strong to be sent back out to our gardeners and our farmers next year. Um, we are gonna weigh these and then put them into cold storage to keep them safe over winter. And these bees are all sorted by the regions of which we've received them from, so that the bees that you hosted will go back to the states that you hosted them from. So all of these bees are native bees. All right, we've now handpicked through millions of mason bee cocoons to get out all the non-viable bees. They are nice and clean cocoons now, and now we're gonna put them in winter storage. We have a walk-in refrigerator where we store our bees, and we put them at about 37 degree temperatures where they'll sit here and hibernate over winter, and then we will release them the following spring. We will send them back to gardeners and to our farmers to pollinate crops. So that's the cleaning process. Yeah. 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 So, right. If they're crunchy, there's usually, they're usually not viable anymore. That's what we find when we roll our hands. We're like, oh, that's a crunch noise. Um, but if they're amber, if they show like an amber when you put them over a flashlight, they're not viable anymore. If you see, can you see through them? Yeah. That's the hardest part of releasing bees, is knowing the timing of the weather. Because around here, you know, it'll be 55, bees will emerge, but then it'll be a tricky, ooh, it's hot, it feels like spring, and then it'll snow, right? So it's always tricky. We also have garden, backyard gardeners that host our bees that are wanting to pollinate Asian plums that bloom first, right? Or apples. So um, you can stagger your release of your bees. We have a large kit that comes with two tubes. So if you have a large orchard that you want, you'll keep one tube in the fridge and then you'll release the other tube so that you can have one tube do your Asian pears and then one do, do your apples. Um, so I can help guide you with that. I will get online, be careful saying this because then I'll get a lot of calls, but I love to go to Google Earth and you give me your address and we'll look at your yard. And we're like, oh, go there, go there, go there. Like, how big is your orchard? How big are, what are we trying to pollinate? And so we'll come up with a bee strategy on what to do, so. So we have, I, like I said earlier, I teach and educate kids. We have science, STEM research teachers that buy our kits and they do a whole program with the bees. We have free printable workbooks and worksheets and videos for all the kids. If you go to our website, rentmasonbees.com, I have a youth page. You can go and download any of this stuff. If you have grandkids and you want to send a starter kit, and they can learn how to do it. I love teaching at the schools because when you get your mason bee cocoons in the tube, you can have the kids hold a baby bee. So they get to hold a cocoon. And they're like, I have them all sit crisscross applesauce and they have to be really quiet. We don't want to wake up the bees. 
and they'll put a bee cocoon in each one of their hands. And then some of my older kids, I'll have, okay, go listen to it, can you hear it? Because sometimes you can hear it vibrating, because you can hear it, because there's a real big bee in there, right? And so even my high school kids that I work with are like, oh, that's so cool. So there's a lot, goosebumps again. It's just so much fun to teach our youth and our kids. They don't know about this. Yeah, so with our starter kits, we provide a bag of clay that comes with it, and you want to have that about five to 10 feet from your Mason Bee house. Yeah. Okay, so as I've mentioned, farmers are starting to utilize more and more solitary bees for all of our crops and all of our orchards. And so this is what one of our big totes looks like out in farms and crops. Um, so this is a very advanced group. <laughs> are almonds a nut or a fruit? Raise your hand if you think it's a nut. Raise your hand if you think it's a fruit. They are a fruit. I didn't know this. I learned something new as well. So almonds, cashews, and pecans are seeds inside of a droop. I looked up how to say that. It's not droupe, it's droop. <laughs> or a stone fruit. So it's kind of like your pit inside. It's like the pit inside the fruit. So I went out last year um, with our team to one of our almond orchards. We, we work with a lot of almond orchards, and we went out to go check on our bees. Now, I love this kind of stuff. Like, this is just so much fun for me. And so we went out, and Jim, our owner, who's been doing this forever, he's like, do you want to see what a baby almond looks like? I'm like, yeah, I want to see what a baby almond looks like. I've never seen that before. Oh, wait, wait, let me mic you up. We need to do a video about what a baby almond looks like so we can teach everybody what a baby almond. And so I show this video to all the kids that I speak with at school. So do you guys want to see what a baby almond looks like? Yeah. yeah. I thought it would be really fun to show all of you what a baby almond looks like. So Jim is going to open up one of these almond blooms and we're going to show you inside what a teeny tiny baby almond looks like. So go ahead, Jim. So on this, this is a spent flower, so the petals have all fallen off. And let's see if it's pollinated. Uh, the nutlet would form right here at the base. And so what we do is we just tear that open and see if there's anything in there. Side of that is a little tiny white nut. There it is on my finger. So that is the beginning of an almond. So I did a little video to show you the light, the stages of it. This is at Bullseye Farm. This is where we went. So we have mason bee totes all throughout the orchard. They're beautiful blooms. They look like apple blossom. Okay, I figured this group would like to see some plants and trees and stuff. Um, so this, these are best practices for a successful habitat. You want spring blooms. So when you're educating people, if you're helping gardeners plant things in your yard, please educate them on planting early spring blooms. Those blooms that come when it's still cold, when it's still frosty, when the temperature is still dropping. So make sure that you're having them plant that those early bumblebees, those mason bees, all of those bees and pollinators need to have spring food. We have stuff on our website and you guys are master gardeners. Like you guys will, you'll know like what pollen. So there's, there's a lot of talks I read that the pollinator friendly yard, what to plant. There's the table right next to our booth, the Washington State Agriculture, that they have these great little garden cards. We've partnered with, um, we've partnered with pollinator.org, pollinator.org. If you go to their resources, garden cards, they have the most beautiful recipe cards for what to plant in your garden. And they literally look like recipe. They're gorgeous flowers, what to plant for spring, fall, like everything to plant for spring, summer to feed pollinators. It's a great resource, a great company. Um, so mason bee houses need to be hung in sunny south facing. They need that morning sun. Again, they're coming in from spring when it's really cold, so they need to be warmed up in the morning. Our houses are painted black to attract the warmth and to warm up them, warm up the houses. Mud, someone asked me about mud. Yes, you want to have it, that's wrong, it's not 50 feet, it's, I just noticed that. It's about 10 to 15 feet away from your house. And then plant to be friendly. 
Um, okay, this is another one of my favorite videos. And this is not the end of the presentation, this is just halfway. Because you gotta do leaf cutters next. Let's talk about leaf cutter bees. I got I love my mason bees. So leaf cutter bees are teeny tiny little pollinators. They are your summer pollinators. So they emerge when temperatures are 75 plus degrees. Around here in the Seattle side, we don't get to that temperature till late later on. On the east side of the mountains, you're going to get to that temperature a lot quicker. So when we give leaf cutter bees to our hosts in the warmer states, they they have lots of leafcutter activity. Out here, my bees didn't emerge until that heat wave we had in Seattle. It was just a late, it was a really cold summer. So um, they're amazing little pollinators. Um, they also, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. So they live six to eight weeks, just like your mason bees do, and they li lay about 15 to 20 babies inside their nesting chambers. And uh, oh, I was gonna bring that up. It's at my table. I have a, a sample block of what they look like. Um, so they're teeny tiny little bees. They also don't sting. Um, and they're amazing little gentle bees. OK, you ready? Hey, everyone. It's Tira with Rent Mason Bees back out at our shop. And we are still unboxing all of your nesting blocks. So thank you for sending them back in. Um, as we're doing this, we are all finding a couple of blocks that still have some leafcutter bees emerge which is a great opportunity for me to show you how teeny tiny these little tiny bees are. They are the sweetest little bees. Um, don't worry, we'll release them out here to our yard and have them pollinate and enrich our habitat out here. Um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to show you um, how some of these little bees are emerging and how teeny tiny they are. I'll pick up a couple of them and show you. Come here, little bee. So you can see how cute they are. They are amazing little pollinators. As you've learned from our videos, leafcutter bees were the bees that saved alfalfa crops. Um, because they are so tiny, they are the only pollinator that can land on an alfalfa flower and not trip the pistil. Um, other bees and other pollinators, they can't get into it without the flower reacting and telling them to get off me. Um, but these little bees have saved our alfalfa. They're remarkable pollinators. Again, belly floppers, just like our mason bees. And it's just fun today to be able to see some of them 
emerging and share it with all of you. Um, I did get some video of them emerging and some macro lens and their eyes are unbelievable. So I will share all that with you, um, but just wanted to take a second and show you these teeny tiny little bees. All right, thanks for hosting everyone. Happy pollinating, bye. Okay, so um, again, belly floppers. They collect pollen. They have the scopa, solitary bees. They have the scopa all over their bellies, so they belly flop and they collect pollen everywhere. Um, they are great for your veggie garden. So if you have a garden or you have friends that have a garden or you're teaching people and they want to get more veggies, and that's the leaf cutter bees are great for your veggie gardens and anything that blooms in the summer. But it's got to be warm enough. It's got to be warm enough, yeah. If it's not, then those are the mason bees. They linger on, but yeah. Um, they use tiny pieces of leaves. Okay, I've already heard from a few people. I don't like the how they chew my, my plants. They're not, they're, not, they're not damaging your plants. And you saw how tiny they are. They take these teeny, tiny, little, tiny half circles. If you have big holes, that's not a mason bee or a leaf cutter bee. They're tiny little edges. They do like roses. If you have roses and you're really passionate about having perfect roses, they love rose leaves. But you guys, they're making little leaf sleeping bags for each one of their babies. So if you can sacrifice to make babies, they carry this teeny tiny little leaf. She crawls into the nesting chamber. It's a little blurry because this is before I had my macro lens, but you get the idea. That's how tiny it is. Tiny, tiny. That's what it looks like. get the idea okay so all right she takes that little leaf she crawls into the hole she sits back there and she chews it up and makes it really pliable then she pushes it up around the edge she goes out and gets another one pushes it chews it pliable pliable she'll do it takes her three to four hours to make each leaf sleeping bag so she'll go in there she'll lay her pollen loaf she'll lay her egg and then she'll get leaves and she'll tighten it up and she'll make it really tight. I have examples up at my booth. You can see what these little leaf cells look like. They're amazing and they're like artwork. I mean, when my team knows when we're opening up blocks and they see beautiful stuff, they have to save it for me because I love to show it and it's so pretty. So they'll use little tiny leaves or in this case, flower petals. They'll use little U-dub, sorry, wazoo. They'll use little, U, little blue, pink, purple. We find some gorgeous leaf cutter cells. So, yeah, that's the, I know this is wazoo, but this is, that's a white, well, it's no yellow in it, so we're good. <laughs> so those, that's what a leaf cutter cell looks like. Again, like you saw in the video, they saved our alfalfa because they are amazing little pollinators that can get in. That's what an alfalfa flower looks like. The pistol trips when the big bees try to get onto it, but the alfalfa, or the leaf cutter bees can pollinate that easily. Um, so we have a leaf cutter harvest. When we get your blocks back, we then harvest all the leaf cutter bees. We can't clean them like we do the mason bees because they're not waterproof. They're tiny, fragile little leaf, like each little tiny leaf cell. So we harvest them out and then we 
um, store them in winter um, hibernation. So this is how we do leaf bees by hand. They are super fragile in the leaf state. Um, mason bees and leafcutter bees are different. Mason bees spin a silken cocoon and hibernate in the silken cocoon and then emerge early spring. Leafcutter bees lay a larvae. So each one of these cells has a tiny little leafcutter larvae inside each cell and they will use leaves or flower petals to lay their babies in and then they'll wrap them up snug. I will post links down below on learning more about our leaf cutters. But I wanted Nina to show you how we harvest and extract all of the cocoons from our leaf cutter blocks. So, so we have these prongs over here that we line up each cell to and they just very gently slide them out in little tubes and it's very gentle on them and it cleans it all the way and they come out in these perfect little tubes. Just like that. So, okay, so how you can help. So I know a lot of people don't like dandelions. Okay, good. They're part of the sunflower family. They're yellow, they're supposed to make you happy. Um, they are a bee's first food, really important. We started a campaign, I know the Midwest does this. They do a whole thing called No Mow May. Keep your dandelions, keep your grass long, keep them going. Because if you don't have anything blooming in your yard, these are the first things that are blooming. And when those are blooming, that means that your mason bees, your bumblebees, other things are going to be moths, anything. You know, dandelions are a really critical first food for pollinators. Um, we have a, um, there's lots of resources online. I'm sure through Master Gardeners, there's a lot of great resources as well. We, we have a, a few of safe gardening tips. So if you have slugs, how to safely remove them. Uh, earwigs. Um, a lot of people in, in the Midwest especially will spray for mosquitoes and mosquito spray is really harmful for bees. So I have blog posts where I have tips on how to take care and manage all of this safely for your bees, so safe gardening tips. Um, you're going to want to release more um, pollinators, uh, more solitary bees. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Uh, there's a lot of programs in the area that um, sell mason bees. Make sure if you're buying mason bees online, you're doing it through an Orchard Bee Association, OBA, Orchard Bee Association. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that will sell bees in bamboo tubes that are full of bees, that are plugged. We're gonna send you five tubes of bees. Well, that hasn't been cleaned. There are, uh, we don't know what species you're getting and you're probably gonna be getting a lot of predators as well. So, um, and then if you're getting at garden nurseries, that's usually a safe place to get bees because they're locally sourced. Um, and then, I just got my 10 minute warning. So um, we have a program here. You're, you can raise your own bees and learn how to clean them yourselves. If you don't wanna clean them, that's where the rental part is. You just rent the blocks and release the bees. So it's, again, the whole cleaning process. Um, I mentioned the Mother Earth News. There's our famous bee. Um, on, well, not on the cover, but on the, right on the inside was our famous solitary bee. And I love what Mother Earth News says. When solitary bees show up, success literally blooms all around. So I'm gonna wrap up with my favorite new video, some of you have already seen, but I wanted to really ask for help. Um, there are three of us at our company. We do three million mason bees, 40 million, but there's three of us. There's one of me that's going around speaking. I do all the YouTube videos. Michelle, we have, all, uh, we have people that come in and help. I'm gonna provide this PowerPoint presentation on my website. If you wanna use it, you're welcome to use it. You can take the slides out, you can do whatever you want. My videos are always available on YouTube. I have printed, I just picked these up yesterday. We made new flyers, and I love these flyers. Um, they are very educational. So I have how mason bees are born, the life stages, the predators, how to create a successful habitat. You are welcome to come to my booth and take however many of these that you want. I also have I Love Mason Bee stickers up there. You're welcome to take, right? So if you want to help spread the word and teach people about how to care for pollinators, I know that a, a lot of master gardeners have booths at farmer's market and you're welcome to just grab some brochures and leave them at the booth at the farmer's market because this is an educational piece that'll teach people. And if you really want them to make an impact, this is the panel. Um, so this video that I'm showing you next is my new video that took me two years to make. And I, well, I'll just play it. I'm just, it's just, I love this video. It's just so, and the music is all time, so we'll see. Hopefully this, the, the music's been delayed, but we'll see. So this is the life cycle of a mason bee and how you can make an impact.
you'll recognize some of this, but. Thank you guys so much.